Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we have a decision from the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit coming out of California. This is the case of Ferrando de Valle versus the County of Sonoma, Bo Zastro and Scott Thorne. In this case, police officers used excess force against Mr. Deval, and Mr. Deval is complaining under a 1983 cause of action for excessive force. The two officers are being evaluated for their role in this, so we're going to evaluate their responsibility and whether or not qualified immunity applies to their conduct. So let's get started with this. Defendant appellants Scott Thorne and Bo Zastro separately appeal from the district court's denial of their motion for summary judgment based on qualified immunity. So the district court said no qualified immunity. Okay. Reviewing de novo, we affirm as to Thorne and reverse as to Zastro. So the district court said that both cops are denied qualified immunity. And the court of appeals said you're right to one and not right to the other. So one cop is denied qualified immunity. One keeps his qualified immunity. Let's read on. Viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the plaintiff appellee, Fenderado Deval, a reasonable jury could conclude that Thorne's use of a taser and baton on Deval constituted excessive force. In September 2016, Thorne and Zastro, who were then Sonoma County Deputy Sheriffs, responded to a neighbor's call about a domestic dispute at Deval's home. The neighbor reported that the dispute sounded verbal, not physical, and that Deval's wife sounded like the aggressor. The deputies arrived to find Deval alone in a locked bedroom. Body camera footage shows that when Thorne kicked open the door and entered, Deval was lying shirtless on the bed, using his cell phone with both hands in view. Thorne ordered Deval several times to stand up. Deval did not do so, instead calmly stating that he was calling a lawyer. Thorne reached out four times to grab Deval's right forearm, and each time Deval pull, pulled it out of his grasp. On the fifth such occasion, Thorne approached to reach for his cell phone, causing Deval to push Thorne away. Immediately, Thorne discharged his taser into Deval's bare chest from close range. Several seconds later, Thorne struck Deval's right arm with a baton. So you have a witness who is lying on his back in bed on a phone and not posing an imminent threat, but he is refusing instructions from the police, and he's, and he's even pushing the police away, which probably technically qualifies as assault and battery on a police officer. So was this proper use of a taser? Let's read on. A jury could conclude that Thorne's use of force under these circumstances was objectively unreasonable. So they're saying it's a jury question. Duvall had not been verbally or physically aggressive and did not pose an imminent threat to anyone. He did not commit any severe offense. And although he actively resisted Thorne's attempt to grab his arm and cell phone, that resistance did not involve any violent actions towards the officers. Moreover, it was clearly established at the time of Thorne's action that discharging a taser on a non-threatening individual who had not committed a serious crime and had not engaged in aggressive or violent resistance would violate the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you, Kotako. You know, your, your wife yells at you and is the aggressor, and half an hour later, they kick in the door to the bedroom, you're tased, beaten, and arrested. You know, sometimes men cannot get a break. You know, sometimes men are really on the wrong end of these things. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's in domestic violence situations in particular, it seems like it's always the guy who winds up getting blamed and arrested. Not always, always, but sufficiently always enough that it makes you wonder sometimes that what's really going on. So, yeah, that's something that needs to be looked into. Duvall does not dispute that Zastro did not personally use unreasonable force, but he argues that he's an integral participant in the alleged use of force, and we disagree. So there's a pretty big factual difference between the two police officers. One of the police officers actually physically did all these things, and the, the, even the person who was hurt said this other officer didn't physically participate and didn't to cause any harm to him personally. So there's a factual difference between the two. And that's part of the reason the court's coming to the conclusion it did. A defendant officer may be held liable as an integral participant in another officer's constitutional violation if the defendant was aware of the other officer's decision to violate the law, did not object to it, and participated in some meaningful way in the violation. So here the court is basically saying, like, if you had knowledge that this was going to happen and you did nothing to stop it and you participated in some way, then sure. 
but you, all those things have to be true. So if it happened in the moment, then presumably those things aren't true because you didn't have knowledge. But if they told you on the way over, like, we're going to totally kick in this door, guy's door no matter what, and you participate in some way, that would be a violation. So there's a distinct, there's something to distinguish there. Did the officer drive the car that the, um, it has, but it has to be a, cons yeah. So Night Raven says, does this qualify as a conspiracy because the other person drove the car? No, because a, a conspiracy has to be for an illegal thing. It has to be illegal, right? So like you and I have a conspiracy at this moment to participate in the stream, right? Because you and I are both participating. So we have an agreement by our actions, but it's not an illegal agreement. So it's not an illegal conspiracy. Um, so yeah, he drove him to the scene, but there was no agreement to commit any crime. So there's no conspiracy because there's no agreement between the parties and, and an act furtherance thereof. And same thing like when they're in the bedroom, there's no agreement uh, to participate. So he apparently just stood there. And so there's no conspiracy because there's no agreement to violate the law. You know, the officer just did violate the law. So, yeah, if, you know, technically, technically speaking, uh, technically speaking, for example, if, if I drive you to a bank and you decide while you're in the bank to rob the bank and I didn't know about it in advance, I'm not guilty of anything. Now, trying to prove that in a, in a court of law is going to be tricky at best, but that's legally correct. You know, just because I drove you to the bank doesn't mean I'm in a conspiracy, especially if I'm not, right? So, yeah. yeah if, I, if I drove you away from the bank, well, I'd have to have knowledge that you, that you, that you robbed the bank while you're inside, which presumably I would because presumably, well, not necessarily because a lot of banks use silent alarms. So I might not necessarily hear anything. And depending on what you did on the bank, in the bank, like you might be coming out very calmly. Like maybe you walked in with a backpack and you walked out with a back backpack. How am I to know that like money is now in the backpack? So again, I'd have to have knowledge that I'm driving you away from a bank robbery, which I, so again, it would only, and it probably wouldn't even be conspiracy at that point, it'd be accessory, which doesn't really matter that much. But yeah, I'd have to have some knowledge that you committed a crime to be guilty of anything, at least in principle. So yeah, how I'm going to prove this on the stand is a whole nother set of problems. But by the letter of the law, I'm not guilty for driving you to and even away from the bank if I don't know that anything criminal happened. So, yeah. After Duvall left his bed, Zastro held down Duvall's legs while Thorne applied a six-second cardioid restraint on Duvall and administered several bat bat baton blows. Ouch. But Duvall has not shown that Zastro were aware Thorne would engage in such force or had the opportunity. Am I wrong in reading applied a six-second Cardi, I have forgotten how to pronounce this word. I've forgotten how to pronounce this word. Cardioid? Cardioid? Okay, I now remember. So uh, am I correct that a, a six-circuit cardioid res restraint means like effectively we're putting pressure on a blood vessel on the neck in order to cause you to pass out, which incidentally like can cause brain damage and all the rest of it. Isn't that how Freddie Gray, effect, Freddie, Freddie Gray effectively died when the police put a chokehold on him and cause stop a brain flow and cause him to have a heart attack? So isn't that like really, really dangerous to do that? Um, I think so. So yeah. Carry carotid. Carotid? Carotid restraint? Carotid, really? That doesn't sound right. Ca carotid sounds right. Yeah, carotid. Yeah, carotid. Yeah, that's why I said carotid. Yeah, carotid. I got it right. I got it right. I just had a total mental block for a second where I totally forgot how to pronounce the word. I was like, uh, I forgot how to pronounce this word, but yeah. Zastro maintains he did not know Thorne was applying the carotid restraint because Thorne's body was blocking Zastro's view. Duvall identified no evidence to, to controvert this account, and Zastro could not have anticipated Thorne striking Duvall with a baton, which occurred with minimal forewarning. Accordingly, Zastro's road did not render him an integral participant in Thorne's actions, and Zastro is entitled to qualified immunity. So that is the end of the case of Fernando Duvall versus County of Sonoma and others. In this case, we learn that two police officers came to a domestic violence situation when which the person who reported it indicated that it was the wife who was participating in the domestic violence. 
the police kicked in the bedroom door and found only the husband. Nevertheless, they then proceeded to tase the husband and arrest him for being the victim of domestic violence, I guess. And he is suing for the violation for 1983 because they used excess force. As to one, the court says yes, because he directly participated and directly caused these harms. And to the other, no, because he didn't have foreknowledge and he didn't do anything to facilitate it. So that goes a little bit more to uh, when qualified immunity does apply and doesn't apply, how much of a participant you have to be for qualified immunity to apply or not apply. And that is the end of this case. Thank you for joining me as we both read this case together and now better understand the law. If you're enjoying this legal education content, please subscribe to this channel. It really helps us grow. And check out one of our other videos, including the one that's currently being displayed on the thumbnail on screen. Thank you so much for your continued support. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.